sharing wisdom from our neighborhood with Devin Burkhardt. Our mission at Paths to Understanding is to bridge bias and build unity through multi-faith peacemaking. As we begin, we want to acknowledge that we are standing on the traditional land of the Coast Salish peoples, and we honor with gratitude the land itself, their stewardship of that land through the centuries, and we commit to working with them for a better, more just world. Today, we're so uh, thankful and honored to have Devin Burkhart with us. He's the president of the Institute for Research and Education on Human Rights and coordinates the Seattle office. He has researched, written, and organized on virtually all facets of contemporary white nationalism since 1992 and is internationally recognized for his effort. Devin began as a research analyst with the Coalition for Human Dignity in Seattle and was co-author of Guns and Gavels, Common Law Courts, Militias, and White Supremacy in 1996. In Chicago, he worked as the director of the Building Democracy Initiative, where he reported on white power music and the new nativism, including a groundbreaking background report of the Federation for Immigration Reform in 2001. He developed a new organizing approach to counter bigotry, including the Turn, Turn It Down campaign to stop the spread of white power music and the campaign for a united America to challenge the new nativism. Devin is frequently quoted as an expert by the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Chicago Tribune, the Los Angeles Times, the Philadelphia Inquirer, the Arizona Republic, the Seattle Post Intelligencer, The Nation, and Rolling Stone. He's appeared on CNN, MSNBC, and CBS News, and National Public Radio, and other broadcast media outlets. And all of that is to say we're so thankful, Devin, to have you with us uh, here on our small little podcast. And we hope to, uh, to help everyone understand kind of what's happening in our world right now with respect to, you know, dissident right populism and what's happening. So, Devin, what does IREHR -E study and why is it important? You know, the short answer to that is IREHR tracks the right. Um, a little bit longer answer is that since 1983, IREHR has served as a social justice organization dedicated to standing against bigotry and defending democracy and human rights. To do that, we work to unmask movements, organizations, and, and individuals that threaten democracy and human rights, while at the same time supporting movements that are advancing human rights and democracy. Uh, how we do that is really that we work hard to employ all the latest investigative reporting techniques uh, and strategic organizing to counter racism, anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, nativism, homophobia, and other forms of bigotry and anti-democratic activity. So, so Devin, why are why is studying all of that so important? I mean, what what's uh, what's the big deal with that? So, there are a few people out there. You know, some people might say you know, who have these terrible beliefs and whatever, like, what's the big deal about all that? Well, I think the first thing to understand that the problem today is an order of magnitude larger than when I started doing this work 30 years ago. So it is no longer confined to the margins. Increasingly, we see the problem moving from the margins to the mainstream, not only impacting local communities, but also now more importantly, impacting public policy uh, and threatening our very democracy. Uh, in many instances, the kind of activity we saw on January 6th was a sign of things to come rather than a conclusion of something in the past. It was a reminder that a variety of different movements have come together to work to overturn democracy and make it harder for us to live out those democratic ideals of being a truly multiracial, pluralistic democracy. Wow. So, so there's many people out there that I talk to every every week who feel like democracy is kind of on edge right now. Like like there's there's sort of a, a little bit of a distrust about whether or not we can kind of weather the uh, the, the current storm that we're kind of experiencing. Uh, and um, and so when as people are thinking about this this storm, this sort of movement that's undermining democracy, um, what are some of the the um, the groups and kind of the ideologies that, that are kind of part of the spectrum of, of, of your study? 
Yeah, we study a range of different organizations dedicated to opposing democracy and harming human rights. It ranges everything from, uh, you know, kind of libertarian think tanks to groups like the Tea Party um, to organizations that are working to uh, stop efforts to prevent the spread of the pandemic to folks who are dedicated to kind of far right paramilitarism, to folks who are out and out white nationalists and kind of the range of those different types of organizations. When I started doing this work 30 years ago, those groups often existed in very different silos. They were kind of isolated amongst themselves and you know they worked in different spheres. Today, those silos have been obliterated and many of those different organizations and networks are now working together um, in larger consort to impact our democracy. So what has led them to kind of work together? What's the, what thing has changed in the last, you know, since you first started your work uh, that's led them to work together more effectively? I think there are a number of things that you could point to about that. The first was the success of the Trump presidency. It reminded them that they have access to the halls of power and that they need to uh, claim that kind of influence and that kind and wield that kind of authority. Um, so that kind of opened the doors and the floodgates, if you will, to the mainstream. It gave them access to the halls of power and to the halls of Congress, which they relished. Um, the second thing really in the last two years that's changed is the pandemic. The pandemic has fundamentally altered the far right in this country. Um, it has changed the demographic nature of it. You know, even 15 years ago, uh, 10, 15 years ago, during the Tea Party era, for instance, uh, the gender dynamics, for instance, were 63, you know, 66 percent men, 33 percent women, which was a breakthrough for the far right. Today, with amongst many of the so-called COVID denial groups, many of those are majority women. So it's opened up uh, a far a new demographic to that kind of thinking. In so doing, it's opened up a much larger constituency. You know, today at the institute, we track. Yeah, 1,700 different COVID denial groups with over 2.4 million members. Um, they're fed a constant diet of conspiracy theories uh, and far-right ideology, which has moved so many of them from thinking about this, you know, as a you know individual or public health problem to being, you know, seeing as, as something of. Uh, epic proportions that they need to take up arms against to stop their uh, the assault on freedom. Uh, the kind of radicalization paths that we see today are dramatically different than when I started doing this. You know, it used to be that when someone stepped onto the conveyor belt of radicalization, you know, it would take them years until they were at the point where they were willing to take up arms or to harm others. Today, that radicalization period on that conveyor belt is taking months, sometimes weeks, because of the inundation and the um, sponsorship of it by so many others. Uh, that, I think, is a really big challenge for us. And as it's grown in size and moved into so many different corners of the American public, that makes it so much harder to try to eradicate. You know, so often we think about this as being confined to somewhere else. But this is a problem that exists everywhere. Right? It is a problem that is exists in rural America as much as it does in urban and suburban communities, exists all over, um, and it's having a real impact, I think. One of the things that we do at the Institute while tracking this is we look at the, you know, those efforts to move into the margins to the mainstream. So in May, we'll release a report um, that looks at their the efforts of the far right to enter the state legislatures around the country. In that report, uh, we've identified in 2021-22, 878 different legislators who have joined different far-right Facebook groups. That's everything from COVID denial groups to uh, white nationalist supporting groups to groups that you know want to carry out a second civil war and overthrow the American government, uh, you know, and carry out uh, a return to their ideals of what they view the, the country and the constitution. 
So that's a pretty dramatic change. And I think those are all things we're keeping an eye on moving forward. So when I was a kid, we had an area nations group get started in my hometown of La Crosse, Washington. Mm -hmm. It was led by um, an anti-tax, you know, guy. Um, and they were even going to plan some, you know, area nations war games out on his, on his property, on his farm. And basically what happened is, I mean, you know, I mean, the guy even had a, a guy in jackboots, you know, and kind of a neo-Nazi uniform as his bodyguard, right? Mm -hmm. The FBI came in, swooped in, you know, arrested him for tax evasion and other things. And that whole thing just kind of went away. Like everybody realized, oh my gosh, like this is weird. I don't want nothing to do with this, you know, and people, it really deconstructed that movement. You know, maybe not all the ideologies, but it deconstructed that movement. And as I think about like what many, many progressive and moderate Christians Christian communities, they think of hate groups as these fringe organizations that are meeting in some, you know, dark basement somewhere, mm -hmm. and they don't see the connection between those groups, um, who those, you know, bad people who believe those things, and their family members and their neighbors, and the people who are now in government, they don't see the connection between those. And so I think there's there's a real naivete in much of the of sort of the progressive and moderate you know Christian community, and uh, and that really concerns me, right? That we are that we're not aware of of what has changed, and so you say that that the the pandemic, but also uh, the Trump the success of the Trump administration to kind of bring all these fringe groups together with a whole lot of what would have been considered you know ten years ago just kind of some conservative political ideologies like that is a very different scenario now absolutely it's a completely different world you know one of IRHR's longtime mentors was the reverend ct vivian you know and he always made a point of reminding folks that they don't always wear sheets and they don't always come wearing a swastika armband um and that the situation is constantly moving it's like a tube of toothpaste you squeeze it in one end and the contents go to a different part of the tube uh, we are dealing with a situation now where squeezing that tube is put it all out on the table and we are in the middle of a completely different scenario so part of what we try to do is help people unpack those mythologies that we have from the past and what this used to look like and help them understand what it's really like today. Because the situation certainly is dramatically different than when I started doing this 30 years ago. And I know it's a lot different than even it was a decade ago. So um, it's always good to help people get ahead and look to where this stuff is going um, so that they're not stuck on thinking about just how it was in the past. Yeah, I mean, I think I think a lot of folk, well-intentioned folk, think of this these as fringe uh, issues with a few. But then the the other reality is that that a lot of folk that I talk to are realizing that these kind of messages are coming from their family members. Yeah, who have who are completely focused on on this sort of uh, the sort of narrative. And I guess what I what I would be interested in in hearing a little bit is. What's the narrative that sort of ties all this together? What are the what are what are some of the the stories the the, the sort of the explanatory story for the world that that many of these groups are are organizing themselves around? There are that's a really really good point to focus on. I think there are a couple of different important things that tie the far right in general together. The first is their ideological construct. And it's what we've often described as a kind of middle American nationalism. Okay. It's the idea that so-called middle Americans, either implicitly or explicitly defined as white and Christian, are being squeezed from above by the elites, which may or may not be defined in an anti-Semitic way. Oftentimes it is. And from below, from the multicultural hordes or, or from the unproductive, those who are, you know, wanting to take and squeeze the middle class and take away their rights and privileges and their wealth. Um, so that's part of it, right? It is that idea that there is a conspiracy between the elites and people of color to deny the, the so-called middle Americans their rightful place in society and their right to uh, 
you know, do what they want to do. I mean, we've certainly seen this play out writ large during the pandemic, and it was certainly part of the, the big thing that made Trump so popular, right? That kind of ideal, ideological perspective runs throughout most of the far right today. So that's one thing. The second thing that's really important uh, and that is so dominant is conspiratorial thinking, right? The idea that there is, you know, either the, uh, you know, a secret cabal of the deep state who's out to, you know, gather up children and drink their blood for their, the adrenochrome, or it is the, you know, the Bilderbergers or the Rothschilds or, you know, some other nefarious organization out there to control the levers of power to continue to turn that vice and squeeze that middle is really part of the, the conspiracy. So we see that playing out today in so many different narratives, right? It's um, regurgitating age old anti-Semitic tropes around things like the blood libel and around, you know, the attacks on children. So whether that is the, you know, the QAnon conspiracy theories or the, the attacks on critical race theory today or the attacks on trans folks and, you know, uh, comprehensive sex education, all of those things the critique of them so often today is coming from this conspiratorial thinking, right? It is a lack of a grounding in reason or empirical evidence, but it is that based in fear that drives people, uh, you know, to go to such extreme lengths today um, to engage in the kind of not just political campaigning, but threats, harassment, intimidation, and violence that we see so common as a part, as part of the movement today. Yeah, you know, uh, so a, a whole bunch of things. I mean, you that is such an incredible series of statements you just made there. I want to unpack a couple parts of it. I mean, just first of all, let's just talk about the violence part. So in, in the last couple of years, you know, I've participated in some Black Lives Matter, you know, uh, you know demonstrations uh, downtown in Accordus, a small town, peaceful place, you know, a place where you want all the, all the, uh, the the folks to come through and go to the ferry and stop by and have a nice, you know, afternoon uh, downtown, uh, tourist place, and yet some of the high school kids that were leading that that uh, those demonstrations uh, received death threats received uh, physical intimidation and physical violence yeah. uh, from people on the right, people who were associated with the Tea Party before and now, uh, you know, part of, of, the, um, of the, the conservative Trump side, you know, of things. And, and that has such a, a, a painful and challenging, um, it's not only painful and challenging for the students that received the threat, and, and, I, and I was threatened too, uh, but the, the, the problem is that it tends to make people in, in the middle sort of back off and it even create more space yep. uh, for, for that kind of right-wing populism that is, that is at work. Um, so that, that threat of violence has a real, has a real uh, corrosive effect on that, that, that entire culture. And, and I noticed that when people engaged in one small bit of violence... Um, they seemed willing to and kind of get away with it. They were willing to do more. Absolutely. Yeah. I think the, you know, groups like the Proud Boys are a prime example of that, right? What started on the streets of places like Berkeley and Portland and Seattle, um, you know, quickly morphed into engaging in the kind of uh, violence on the streets in countless communities around the country and helped lay the path for what led to January 6th and the kind of attack on our inst our democratic institutions in an effort to violently overthrow an election, right? So that is definitely part of the problem. And during Black Lives Matter, we had countless reports, hundreds and hundreds all over the country where there were acts of harassment, intimidation and violence against folks who were peacefully out protesting, uh, you know, in support of black lives, uh, you know, whether it be groups, you know, like an Olympia where groups showed up um, with uh, heavy weapons and, you know, harassed and intimidated folks to uh, engaging in uh, plots to firebomb, uh, Black Lives Matter demonstrations like they did in uh, Las Vegas and in uh, Denver, 
um, to the countless efforts to uh, chill the speech and the democratic participation of so many of us who were concerned about our democracy. You know, that is one of the insidious things that violence does is it makes it impossible to for so many to engage in the democratic process and they're silenced by that fear. Um, that's been one of our big challenges over the years is how we can help people unite and face that fear together and stand in the face of such um, violence and bigotry. You know, Devin, so if I'm a listener, you know, right now, and, and, you know, we're describing this, you know, very large, you know, set of movements that have kind of coalesced and not just kind of, they're <laughs> receiving uh, normalization on, on major cable uh, television stations, especially Fox News, but there's been uh, conservative radio for decades now across the country laying the groundwork for some of this. I remember a friend of mine in a church, uh, well, he was a member of the church, and he, I, 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 he was listening to the radio one day, and I heard him laughing. And I said, well, John, what are you laughing about? You know, and he said, well, uh, I just heard Rush Limbaugh talk about the feminazis. Mm. And I said to him, you know, John, I'm not sure that that's good for you. He says, oh, it's just funny. And I said, well, are you sure? Because you're just comparing people like your daughter who want to have like, you know, equal rights for women with Nazis. And he says, well, I don't take it seriously. Well, he didn't take it seriously until the point he did. Mm -hmm. And yeah. then he lost a relationship with his daughter. He lost and he and he he told me he never wanted to see me again. But then about three weeks before he died, he reached out on Facebook and said that he was sorry. Mm. And, th and that was a beautiful, that was a beautiful moment, but that was a beautiful moment that had 20 years of pain. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I guess if I'm a listener and, I, and we've kind of experienced some of this and we're hearing about this, this broad based movement that is, that is being normalized, that's being becoming part of the Republican Party today and how it functions and operates, and part of its energy source in a way, um, isn't that also a conspiracy theory? Like, are, are, like, how do you respond to people say, well, you're, you're bringing a conspiracy theory to this whole thing, and what's the difference between what they're saying and what you're saying? Well, it's a great distinction. I think for us, you know, the, we rely on data and facts. Um, to point out the connections between different organizations and individuals. So, for instance, of the 878 different legislators we've got documented in the, our new report, we can show you for all 878 exactly which group they joined and when and what that group promotes. Right. So yeah, I don't think that's a conspiracy right. in the sense that it is relying on the kind of magical thinking um, or creating a kind of, you know, a, a, a kind of demon. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, we don't want to dehumanize those folks who believe this stuff, either the leaders or those individuals. We want to point out the facts and help people understand that this is a challenge to uh, democracy and civil and human rights, and that it needs to be engaged with rather than be afraid of. Right? Our goal is to try to um, also, because I think lots of your listeners know that there's a lot of really bad stuff going on. Uh, and what we want to do is try to actually contextualize it, help people understand the actual breadth and width of the problem and, you know, help them better face that fear with facts. Um, so I think that we're trying to do kind of the opposite, uh, you know, in a lot of different ways, we're trying to unpack that and help people get to what is really facing them so that they can then develop in their communities, effective barriers against bigotry and deal with the challenges that we have to face rather than thinking about this with the kind of backward looking vision about this, how this stuff used to be, or a fearful vision that makes people think that this stuff is everywhere around them, right? We want to have them have the facts and understand that, yeah, we got some problems in front of us, but really, you know, the, the wind is at our sails that there are so many more of us. If we figure out ways in which we can unite and come together that, you know, we can take back our democracy and we can do things that will help live out the ideas of Dr. King's beloved community rather than allowing those folks to define 
you know, us for the rest of what's going on, right? This is not a challenge that we're going to just face today. You know, right. as America continues to go through these demographic changes that we are, you know, sometime between now and 2050, when white folks are no longer a numerical majority, um, this is going to be a continuing challenge that we're going to have to address, right? How we address those who are opposed to that and how we live up to being a multiracial, multi-ethnic, pluralistic democracy. That's what's going to be the real big thing for us moving forward is how we get to that and how we address those. And it's going to be a fight that not only you and I have to deal with, but then the next generation and the generation after that as well. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, so two, two parts here. I mean, I, I think about the people I know that have bought into conspiracy theories and usually there there's, there's, they're, they're buying into that around some kind of pain that they've experienced or some the fear of something that they love and value is going to be lost, right? And then they, they buy into another one. So first it's anti-Semitism in, in some kind of soft or hard form. And then it's anti-Muslim bigotry. And then it's anti-LGBTQIA bigotry. And when they get like two or three or four of those kind of put together where they're sort of really angry and they feel like something that they love is lost. And, and what these groups are doing, as we said, you know, before we started the, the recording, what these groups are doing is leveraging what people love in order to, to turn them against people in their community, to turn them against each other, right? They're really manipulating folk at a very deep level. But once they get two or three of these sort of, you know, data points, these conspiracy points kind of cemented in their head and their heart, it's really hard to bring them back. Yeah. And I think in the work that we've tried to do is let's keep lifting up common shared values. Uh, we know from research that most Americans still believe that everyone should be able to pray or not pray the way they want, that everyone should be able to vote, um, that we're a country of rule of law. I mean, people still believe those things, even people who are in the groups that we're talking about. And so when we're able to message to them and, and lift up a positive vision uh, about how protecting one group's rights is a way to protect your own because we're all in this together. Like I have watched time after time when in, in large public meetings where people come in and that you can see the folk that are part of this group we're talking about. And you can see people in the middle and you can see people you know, more, you know, on the, Hey, we've got to stand up to this kind of, but our, what we always go for is that the whole room lowers its intensity. Mm -hmm. And that people can see kind of like, oh, okay, like we can have a conversation about this. Um, so, but those conspiracies really work on people and how to back them off of that. So many times progressives are just so angry about it. They just start raging at people instead of building on that, that those, those common values. And I don't see that as being effective at all. No, it's not, you know, the research pretty well backs that up as well. You know, the social science and our work on this is pretty clear that there's really what are called the three P's of de-radicalization that are essential. It's the personal. So if it's someone that you have a personal relationship, that is always the best. And you have the ability to reach them in ways that others do not. And then it's the, the push you need to push away those bad ideas and the conspiracies, unpack them and help people understand why they're wrong, but also pull those individuals closer to you rather than dehumanizing them in response or pushing them further away and isolating them. Uh, you need to pull them closer to you saying that I love and respect and honor you, but those ideas are not things that I can have around because they're toxic and they're, they're harmful. Um, that is the kind of, rudimentary basis of de-radicalization are those three P's. And um, that's true at a micro level on the individual basis. It's true on a macro level in terms of the organizing that you do. All of our work has always been focused on those constituencies that are targeted for radicalization, right? And working in those communities to find ways in which you can develop the messages and the connections and the ties to build up ways to try to stop um, that from getting a, you know, an impact and sinking deep roots. Right. You know, so Devin, we're getting ready. The second part here is we're getting ready to, to kind of un you know, launch a, a whole effort called Let's Go Together. And the whole, the whole, you know, kind of insight into that is, is 
in Western Washington and Washington State in general, we're going to have millions of people move here in the next 30 years. And we know from the work you do, we know from the work, for instance, of Robert Pape from the University of Chicago, that most of the folk who ended up at the insurrection on January 6, 2001, were, were not lone individuals who don't have a girlfriend and a job. These are people who are established and who believe that that people of color, people of other religious traditions are gaining rights faster than they are, right? Which, of course, that's not a, a correct frame logically, but that's how they feel, right? That's, that's the way they see it. And so what's going to happen in small towns in Western Washington and Washington State in which there are a whole bunch of folk moving in, in which religious diversity is on the rise, in which cultural diversity is on the rise, in which there's people with different skin tones, you know, around that didn't used to be there in their in their perception, is we're, we're likely to see that same kind of reaction. And so what we want to do is go out and prepare the, the, the white, mostly mainline churches to engage in interfaith or multi-faith relationships and, so that people can know each other, so they can do service projects with each other, so they can stand with each other in public spaces, so have show public solidarity. And the reason that's important is because uh, even though we're receiving all these messages from the national media and from Facebook and all this kind of stuff about how everything's falling apart, pe people still feel more powerfully positive about local issues, local things, local relationships, local work. Yep. But we have to help, I think, uh, people in these, in these mainline Christian churches to understand the power that they have to be able to convene these kind of multi-faith partnerships, do some work together uh, to benefit the larger community, to stand with each other so that we have a positive story to tell about what our future could be like. Because the folk on the right are telling a story that's very negative. And, and so one of the challenges for us is that we need to see, as you said earlier, the, the threats that we have, but we have to continue to lift up a positive vision and then have local expressions of that positive vision so that people in those communities can relax and can say, you know, it's going to be okay that the sick community is going to move in because those people are wonderful. They just went and did this thing at the homeless shelter with the Lutherans. Like that's, that's the kind of thing that needs to happen. It can't just be a messaging campaign. It has to be exactly. a campaign of action. No, that's exactly the case. I mean, I'll give you a, an example from the early days of the Institute. It's a little before my time, but I think it's really important and kind of illustrative of this. During the farm crisis of the 1980s, uh, particularly in the Midwest, when family farms were going under at a record rate because of changes in macroeconomic and agricultural policy, um, the far right stepped in, you know, groups like the Posse Comitatus and the Aryan Nations tried to use that to organize in local communities. The Institute worked really closely with mainline Christian churches, Jewish organizations, and others to, to both uh, counter the spread of the far right and then to address those challenges that the that farmers were facing. So either it be work on foreclosure issues in the state legislature or work with, um, you know, helping, you know, farmers find uh, new ways um, to refinance their loans at a kind of local level or finding new opportunities for folks in these situations. Um, that was all done with really hard work on the ground. You know, people in common struggle facing both the fear of the far right and also the real economic and political challenges that they were facing that made tremendous lasting differences over the long run, right? They essentially kicked the posse and those other groups out of those areas and really did everything that they could possibly do to, you know, to stop the, you know, the impact of the farm crisis from really getting much, much deeper. Um, those are the kind of lessons we try to employ. So whether it be around, you know, immigration issues or around COVID or around, you know, the any number of other changing issues, those that's the exact approach that you need to take. You need to, you know, have people come together and both push away those bad ideas and show that there is an alternative. So that's really exciting. I'm really glad to hear that you all are doing that. Well, and we realize, I think that, you know, there are some, some what we like to call exclusive in-grouping ideas that have woven their way into the fabric 
you know, of Christian theology and interpretation and that sort of thing. Um, but of course, the way we want to engage that isn't by saying that Christians are bad or Christianity is bad or whatever. We want to take people like, you know, to the heart of Christianity. Yeah. And, and the heart of the entire Abrahamic tradition uh, in Genesis chapter 12, verse 3, is that in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed, says God to Abram and Sarah. And so what does that mean? Well, uh, all the families doesn't mean like a mom and a dad or two moms and a couple kids. It doesn't mean that. What it, what it means is a cultural group with a religion and a food and the way they eat food and a way to dress. And so we are an in-group. It's okay to have an in-group. It's okay to have a tradition. But the core value of our in-group is to be a blessing and to recognize the validity of other in-groups. Yeah. Right. And then the word blessing means to speak well of. Well, we're in a time right now where there's incredible dehumanization of all kinds of groups. Well, there was dehumanization in Abram's time too. And, and so that verse is not just, oh, a nice little verse in a story. It is actually a strategy for how to deal with exclusive in-grouping, thinking your, our, our group is the only group and therefore having a lot of intergroup conflict and the dehumanization process that allows you know, some people to be enslaved forever in, in Abram's day. And so that is not just a, a nice little story. That's a strategy for how we can move through this challenging moment. It's okay to have an in-group, but the core value of our in-group is to recognize the validity of and to help in the thriving of other groups. And that we're going to counter dehumanization with speaking well of each other. And part of blessing, the rabbis say, is that it, it comes from the Greek, from the Hebrew word uh, for kneel, which implies offering the best you have um, to another group in a spirit of humility so they can thrive. Because we're all part of a neighborhood and we need each other to be thriving so that we can thrive. So that's 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 part of how we're going to try to try to um, message that and help people understand the depth of that tradition. Um, instead of saying, "Hey, we need to move away from our own in group because it's bad," like that's not what we're going to do. That's very exciting. I'm really looking forward to see how that plays out. So, so Devin, you've been at this for a while, and and you know, I'm sure that there are rough days and and really positive days. Um, you know, can you help us understand like your own personal motivations for doing this work? Like, why are, why are you doing this every day? <laughs> I think there are a couple of reasons. Uh, it's been a lifelong cause of mine. I uh, I grew up in Spokane, so in a, a stone's throw from the Area Nations compound in Northern Idaho, uh, yeah. when, when it still existed. All right, when I was a when I was a teen, uh, white power skinheads used to come over and try to beat up or recruit my friends. So I had a kind of a personal connection to it. You know, my first attendance of a demonstration that I could remember when it was when I was 13, when Robert Matthews, uh, who would go on to form the order, the neo-Nazi terror gang that blew up, you know, that robbed armored cars, killed the Jewish talk show host and uh, an, an Arkansas state trooper. Um, he held a rally in downtown Spokane. It was, you know, I was 13. It was one of the first protests that I'd ever been to. Um, so, you know, I had this understanding of the kind of extent to which this stuff can impact a local community. And I knew that it was real and I didn't have to look elsewhere for it. It was in my backyard. Uh, when I went to, when I went away to school, I happened to be fortunate you know, enough to be in a place where I was exposed to, you know, the importance of, you know, living out the, the ideals of, you know, of Dr. King and other civil rights veterans. Um, and at the same time, there was a cross burning outside a migrant labor camp outside of Bellingham. Um, I, it was an opportunity for me to help bring people together, uh, to stand up against that, to organize a vigil and eventually create the Watkin Human Rights Task Force, um, which I'm proud to say is still in existence, still doing great work up there in Bellingham, yeah. uh, and uh, throughout Whatcom County. Um, and, um, uh, also got hooked up with a group called the Coalition for Human Dignity at a, at that time they're out of Portland. Um, I interned with your organization and, you know, kind of fell in love with the work, 
you know, one of the first things they did was send me off to militia meetings and, you know, other events like that to both to go other undercover and gather information, but also to get an understanding of the reality of this, right? That these are people too. Um, they may have distorted worldviews uh, that want to cause harm to a lot of people, but the way part of what you need to do is understand them as people and also then be able to better unpack what their plans and agendas are. Um, after working, you know, after continuing to show up and volunteer, I think they felt bad and decided to start paying me a little something. Um, you know, and so I worked with, uh, with CHD for four years until I got an opportunity to move out to Chicago and work with Reverend David Ostendorf at the uh, Center for New Community and help build that organization up from a small Midwestern organization to a really big national organization that took on, you know, issues around um, Islamophobia and the new nativism, particularly after 9-11, um, you know, took on anti-Semitism after the killing of a you know, of a number of folks in a two-state killing spree that took place, you know, in our backyard. Um, so I've been around this stuff for a long time and been committed to doing the kind of work that's essential. But what really drives me are a couple of things. One is talking with folks about how this, you know, doing this work and engaging in this kind of struggle changes their community for the better. Yeah, I, I think that's what really keeps me going, hearing those kind of stories every day. Um, secondly, I think having a sense of humor about this stuff, you know, just how bizarre and outlandish it is and just eye rolling it can often be, um, you know, helps me get through the day a little bit. And then I think a third thing that's really been really helpful is, you know, talking to folks who have decided to leave the movement. You know, they share their stories and they tell why they want to leave. Uh, and that's been really helpful, too. And when they say it's because of something that we they heard from us or something that they read and, uh, you know, changed their way, their worldview and they changed the way they were looking at things. Um, that means a lot. Um, so even without all those, I think I would continue to do it because it just needs to be done. Right. Uh, I would love to wake up tomorrow morning and find myself without a need for the type of work that we do. I don't think that's going to happen. So, you know, I'm here for the long haul and we're going to try to work every single day, you know, and put ourselves on the line to try to make sure that we can live out those ideals. Right. I think that, you know, particularly for white folks like myself, right. That, you know, white cis men, you know, we have a tremendous amount of privilege, and, you know, and prestige in this community. And if I can put myself in a, in a position for just one day, every, you know, to, you know, to take on some of that burden uh, and to try to make things a little bit better for everyone else, I think, uh, you know, I'm going to try to do that in any single way I can. This is the way I found out. I think there are tons of ways that people are, are you know, living up to that challenge and, you know, trying to help you know, live out those ideals. Um, but for me, that's going to be the driving force is where I can make a difference. I, uh, you know, I'm a bit of a nerd. I'm a, you know, I enjoy research and writing. And so the fact that I am so privileged just to be able to do that on a daily basis is, you know, really, um, uh, you know, I feel so blessed and so fortunate in that way. And then having, you know, tremendous mentors like, you know, like Leonard Zeskin. Uh, if you haven't read his book, Blood and Politics, A History of the White Nationalist Movement for the Margins of the Mainstream, you've got to. It's an amazing tale of this. Or to work with folks like Reverend William Barber, you know, who now leads the Poor People's Campaign or, you know, CT or many of the other civil rights veterans that we've had the opportunity to work with. I understand that the work that I'm doing is one small part of a much larger chain helping you know build uh, you know uh, uh, this this beloved community and so any part that we can play we're going to try to do what we can to make this a better world thank you so much Devin. that that is so inspiring to hear that and i just want to let you know like i grew up in lacrosse washington 80 miles south of spokane yeah yeah right you know so um so some of the same some of the same kind of social environment you know there um even the lacrosse is only 300 people, right? It's it's a, a lot the same. Um, although there there were no protests in lacrosse standing <laughs> up for anyone else, right? Mm. And there was plenty of of you know negative statements about about different groups. Um, some of that has changed a bit, um, mm. thankfully. Um, so you know, in doing this work, I think you know you you must have like 
been trying to like understand human beings better. Like, what is it about human beings that sort of makes us vulnerable to some of the, these kind of statements, you know? And so I'd be curious to know any reflections you might have, and it doesn't have to be co some kind of complete whole thesis, but what is it about human beings that make us kind of vulnerable to movements like this? I think there are a couple of things. I think, uh, you know, the first thing that's important to understand about this is that their human beings have a deep seated uh, need to feel a sense of belonging and identity, right? Uh, unfortunately, today, far too often, we, groups on the far right define that identity in opposition to others, right. right? That they are defined by not being the, you know, Muslims or not being trans or not being Jewish or not being, you know, the parasites, Right. So that is how they, you know, find identity and they hook into that sense of the need for belonging and provide all of those really core elements. Right. It provides, you know, a deep seated sense of, you know, identity. It provides belonging and a sense of a distorted sense of community because you have others who are sharing the same kind of ideas and believe the same way that you do. Um, the really unfortunate part about that is the longer you believe this garbage, you know, the more you believe that kind of QAnon conspiracies or, you know, the conspiracies about trans folks or any of these other things, the smaller your world becomes and the less community you have, because frankly, no, your friends, your family, they don't want to be around you anymore. Uh, and you also probably don't want to be around them either. So you, you may even lose your job. So your world gets really small. Uh, and the more you, you crave that sense of community and belonging, the more you turn to those groups to find that sense of identity and belonging. So that I think is part of really at the core of so much of this. I think another part of it is that um, we spend so much time, particularly in this country, you know, with these zero sum ideas that it is a competition of scarcity to, you know, collect the, the most uh, and the kind of rugged individualism, particularly out here in the West, that has defined so much of white folks history, um, that it um, feeds into that need to be concerned about being squeezed from above and below that somehow that this that the pie is, you know, is can't grow be a bigger pie, but in fact, is constantly shrinking and then we need to defend more and more of our slices of those. Um, so I think that's also a problem, you know, the, the lack of real understanding of community and the search for identity outside many of those other ways in which we've sought those in the past has been a big challenge. Uh, those are all, you know, I think at the core of it, really kind of driving so much of what we see today. I mean, there are lots of other things, but those I think are, you know, where we could start at looking at some of these, these features. Yeah, I think it's, uh, there's, so I, when I did a lot of public speaking before the pandemic, you know, I, I would use a, a, a real simple formula. You know, I put it up on the screen, you know, scarcity, plus racism times dehumanization. So I put a parentheses around the first two, you know, <laughs> times dehumanization equals violence. Yep. And, you know, and folk would say, oh, that's too, you know, formulaic, that's too simplistic. Well, there's nothing simplistic about scarcity. Nope. Right. I mean, we want to survive as human beings. Yeah. And we're in a larger culture in which the, the primary religion is not Christianity. It's that human beings are producers and consumers in a winner take most economy. And we're, yeah. we're competitors in that, you know, we're, we're, that's, that's who we are. We're competing as producers and consumers and that that's who we are. And, and so you add scarcity to that, you know, then that competition gets even more rough, right? The stakes get, get raised for people. And, um, and 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 so it's been it's been interesting to to listen to people like sort of sort of process that because mm -hmm. um, I think uh, it, for lots of progressive -y people like they sort of believe that we're just getting better and better and, and the world's getting easier and easier it's going to be it's going to be better all all the time like by itself and it's hard for them to to encounter that the sort of some of the vulnerabilities in human beings um, and that's the way I like to think about 
the, the Christian understanding of sin. It's not that human beings are bad. It's that we're vulnerable to certain things. And we're vulnerable to thinking that our in-group is better than their group and getting competitive about that. We're, we're vulnerable to notions of, of scarcity. And uh, it's easy for us to begin to think that the people in that group over there are a threat to everything we hold dear and that therefore are less than human. And therefore, uh, we begin to create a permission structure for violence, which leads us to this moment where we've got 4% of the population, according to some studies, of people who are willing and ready right now to engage in political violence in order to, quote, save the country, right? Right. Mm -hmm. And the question I think a question for for a lot of other folk is, are we ready to come together and work together, you know, to build stronger community so that we can have a more stable democracy, a more peaceful community? And to know that even as we do that work, it's going to be a whole lot of fun, <laughs> you know, so that because that's the other potentiality of human nature is that when we see people of diverse backgrounds getting together and working together, like we all of a sudden relax and say, oh, okay, it's not so bad here. We can begin to trust a bit more. Yeah, I think one of Lenny's um, more popular slogans that he's said for 40 years now is that fighting fascism can be fun. You know, it, it, it is absolutely true, right? That the, um, you know, that the kind of energy and ideas and connections that come from doing this kind of work are so much more meaningful and deep and lasting than you know anything from come that comes from you know engaging in that you know winner take some competitive consumer economy right so about a year ago year and a half ago um i have a family member that was walking you know down this path uh, primarily through fox news initially um and, and like every third time we talked, you know, he would just put out these little landmines in conversation, you know, or he would come up with a whole lot of, out of, out of a sense of anxiety that he had, he would ask me an extremely complex question about, you know, the economy, about racism, about, you know, it, it was, it, you, you could track it just by what Fox News was focused on that week. And, uh, and, and so, you know, what I said to him at some point was, look, I need you to be my, my brother. I don't need to be your debate partner. Uh, I, don't, I don't need that from you. Now, if you want to have a debate about something, then let's put a date on the schedule. Let's spend an hour having that debate and then let's end it. But what I need from you is to be my brother. I do not want to play the liberal, the wacky, dumb liberal who doesn't care about anything in your Fox News, you know, Sean Hannity written family drama. Like, I do not want to play that role anymore. I need you to be my brother because I am working hard out here, partly because I care about America. Probably because I care about, about Jesus, because I care about my, my tradition. Like, I'm out here doing this work and there are days when I'm going to need you to be my brother and to have my back, even if you don't agree with me. Can you do that for me? And it was interesting to watch how he began to process that mm. and, and how he's kind of backed off from asking me all these questions all the time because I told him I loved him and I needed him. And we didn't have to agree in this other stuff. And, uh, and I think, you know, it would have been easy for me at that point just to tell him to, you know, go away. I don't want to talk to you anymore. Every time I talk with you, it's painful. But I, I think there's a way for us to reaffirm folk in our relationship with them without necessarily cutting off the entire relationship, even though there are moments when people do need to cut off relationships, right? I mean, yeah. there, are, there are times when that's true. Uh, but I, I think there are ways for us to, to, to draw some boundaries um, in a way that, that, that can lead to some positive, more positive relational outcomes. Because everybody I know is struggling with, these, with fam family members that are walking down these these pathways. Definitely. Oh yeah, absolutely. Myself included. Yeah. I think it's a, it is, it goes back to that notion of being able to do those three P's, right? You've got to be able to, you know, continue to do the things that pull the folks closer to you while pushing away those bad ideas. Um, and that is, that takes work and real fortitude. And, um, 
you know, and frankly, it's uh, a challenge. Um, and it's not always going to work. Right. Um, but it, when it does, um, you know, the, the impacts tend to be longer lasting and uh, you can bring people back from the edge, right? That this is, while they may have stepped on at a conveyor belt point, you know, because they're watching Fox News or OAN or whatever else, um, there are places where people step off of that conveyor too. Right. Um, you know, and so it's just a matter of lending them a hand to find a way off of that conveyor belt that can really make all the difference. Yeah. And I, and, and, and so Devin, when you, you know, I know a lot of folk out there are just tired of it. And, and I know I get that way too. You know, we're tired of, of having that fight in every sphere of our life all the time, you know? Um, what do you do to take care of yourself in the midst of all this? Like, what do you do to, you know, rest and recover and, and find renewed joy just as a person? Like, what do you do? You know, my, one of my favorite things to do is I, I still, even at my age, play hockey. So that's one of my favorite things to do, um, do it every week. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I like to do woodworking, uh, you know, and I've got a tremendous partner and family that helps me you know, keeps me, that helps keep me going through you know, the thick and thin of it all. You know, I, uh, you know, my wife is a, she's a public school teacher. She's a high school chemistry teacher. And so, you know, the amount of work and effort and things that she puts in far and exceed the kind of things that I've got to deal with on a daily basis. So I draw inspiration from her and try to help and support her as much as I can. And that, that also helps reinvigorate me as well. I think those are all things that are really kind of important to me that, and I also like to play music. Uh, you know, I've always had a musical background. I'm a bass player by training and, played a bunch of bands when I was, you know, when I had a lot more hair back in the day. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. So those are all things that kind of keep me going. Uh, yeah. Well, Devin, I, I just so appreciate you taking some time to have the conversation with us. And would you share with us your, your website so that people kind of know where to go to kind of get some more information? And are there any other places you would encourage folk to go to kind of learn more about uh, this whole, like, you know, dissident right populist movement and all of its different, you know, sort of constituent parts, you know, because I think there is a there is a crazy making element of it. It feels like it's coming from everywhere. Like, yeah, but for people to see the connections between them all is actually kind of helpful. Um, I think um, it, it could be overwhelming at, at first, but then it's helpful because like, oh, OK, like it's coming from these places and there are ways to counter it. Yeah. Yeah. Um... I'd be more than happy to. Uh, the Institute's website is irehr.org. Um, there you'll find a tremendous amount of work uh, that we've done over the years, including some pretty important kind of foundational reports that will hopefully unpack a little bit of this and help you better understand the kind of context about what we're talking about. One of the more recent reports we've done is a report called Facebook and COVID Denial, uh, which looks at the, these 1,743 different groups we track on that platform, uh, you know, and how they've really moved the ideas of COVID denial and other forms of far-right activism into the mainstream. Uh, it goes deep. It's about 120 pages in total worth of uh, materials, maps, videos, and things that will get you kind of up to speed. Um, if you're more interested in kind of the the kind of paramilitary side of things, the report we did last year with the Montana Human Rights Network called Ammon's Army inside the People's Rights Network is a really interesting take on how these ideas met metastasized during the pandemic uh, and helped these far-right paramilitarists find a new audience and grow their organization from, you know, a handful of folks in, you know, that started out in a small Idaho uh, warehouse in April of uh, 2020 to now more than 33,000 individuals around the country organized and prepared to harass and intimidate teachers uh, public officials, nurses, doctors, and others. Um, and then, you know, a lot of our other work there, to, uh, the, including the most recent threat um, for Generation Next is there, the so-called grapers or white nationalists who are targeting young people and trying to, you know, mainstream the ideas of hardcore fascism and white nationalism to a new generation, which have found support in legislative folks like Representative Paul Gosar and Marjorie Taylor Greene and State Senator Wendy Rogers. Uh, all of those things are there, you know, to kind of give you the that all important context and background to help you understand where these challenges are facing. Um, 
And then, you know, if you want to keep up on the up-to-date day-to-day things, you know, follow us on Twitter at IREHR um, or on Facebook. Um, all of those things will give you context and up-to-date the latest and things. And then if you have questions, comments, concerns, you can reach out to us on any of those platforms. Or if you want to also follow on your smartphone, our uh, smartphone app is called Trepper, the anti-bigotry app. It's available for iPhone and iOS. Um, download it from there. You can, if you see things in your community, submit video to us um, or, um, you know, post questions or get information, uh, including a toolkit, which will help you figure out how to deal with these issues as they emerge in your community. Thank you so much, Devin. And I, I just want to say, you know, I, the, the issues that we're facing now, even though, you know, Facebook and and uh, social media in general has kind of um, really changed the how how these groups get together and how they like form a larger coalition. But you know the issues of human nature and human community are are very ancient. They're not new, and we have a lot of wisdom about this. Like one was Ecclesiastes twenty six. I like to quote this a lot. Of three things, my heart is frightened, and of a fourth, I'm in great fear: slander in the city, the gathering of a mob, and false accusation. All these are worth worse than death. Well, the reason that that is in the scripture in Ecclesiastes 25 or 26 verse 5 is to help us have tools to analyze this. And of course, how do we counter this? It's also very simple. It is speaking positive, truthful word, which is what your organization does, right? It's it's gathering people for common cause and for the common good. And it's, it's making sure that we... Um, that we, we hear people out, we hear from people from themselves instead of from third parties who wanna say bad things. And that in doing that, we create life, right? That That is what that ancient wisdom is trying to say. And I appreciate your contribution to all of us being able to do that work better, Devin. So thank you so much for being with us. It's It's been truly an honor and a blessing. And I- Oh, really thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. So, hey, everybody, if you wanna learn, learn more about uh, all of our Paths to Understanding podcasts, you can, of course, go to www.pass2understanding.org. Our podcasts are available on all major podcasting services. Also, check out our YouTube channel uh, where we have both WFON, Wisdom from Our Neighborhood, but we also have Challenge 2.0 led by Jeff Renner. And until then, be well, be calm, and be good to your neighbors.